Hi. As you may have inferred from that quote, in this video I'd like to explore the psychological significance of rebellion. That great topic was suggested by a viewer, someone who goes by the name of Fuzzy8501. So many thanks to you, Fuzzy8501, for that eminently cool idea. Anyhow, as usual, here's a roadmap of the material in this video. As you can see, I'd like to organize it in terms of three types or regions of rebellion. First, rebellion against different aspects of the external world. Second, internal rebellion against ourselves. And finally, existential rebellion against the reality of life itself. And for your viewing pleasure and convenience, you can also find this roadmap in the description of this video, along with links to the timestamps. However, before getting into those three types of rebellion, I'd like to talk for a minute or two about what I think is one of the best models for understanding it generally. And it takes the form of a kind of developmental schema proposed by the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche in his work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In the section entitled On the Three Metamorphoses, Nietzsche proposes that there are three basic forms of human existence that tend to develop in a stepwise fashion. The first of those three has to do with the kind of life whose principal theme is obedience, which would include not only obedience in terms of our observable behaviors, but more importantly, obedience at the level of our internal subjectivity, such as how we adopt other people's opinions about what values we should have, how we should perceive the world, how we should think and speak about things. Nietzsche compares that very docile, obedient type of life to a camel, which for him is basically a beast of burden. In other words, one way of living life is to go around carrying the weight of other people's values and habits without thinking too hard about it. Basically, living in a state of psychological enslavement whose primary logic is thou shalt, which is to say conformity and obedience, which of course would be the antithesis of rebellion. And when you think about it, that type of life is pretty common, and we can easily spend our entire lifetimes that way, basically as beasts of burden carrying the heavy weight of other people's values and habits for them. However, Nietzsche also describes how sometimes a camel will speed into its, quote, loneliest desert and learn to become a rebellious lion, the kind of creature who says a sacred no to thou shalt, as he puts it. The lion, of course, is a hunter and a predator, basically a fighting creature and no longer just a docile beast of burden. And it's pretty obvious what the lion is fighting against, basically against being told what to do, how to think, what to perceive, what values and attitudes are the appropriate ones, etc. But the deeper question is not what is the lion fighting against, but what is he fighting for? What is the point of his rebellion against the all-too-common and seductive habit of blind obedience? Well, Nietzsche claims that the point of becoming a lion is to clear a range of freedom that's not present when all we're doing is lugging the weight of other people's burdens for them. Okay, so the rebellious lion is fighting for his freedom. But then the question becomes, to what end? What deeper purpose justifies all of the woe and travail that laying claim to our freedom almost always entails? In other words, the question becomes, what is human freedom really for? Nietzsche's answer to that question lies in the third metamorphosis of spirit, that of the child. Basically, the child represents several things simultaneously. First, the child is, well, <laughs> just himself. Not merely what other people want him to be, and not merely the opposite of that, but just himself. In that way, the child represents a kind of innocence that lies far beyond the usual evaluative categories of good and evil. But in simply being himself, the child is also a creative originator of new values, new ways of perceiving and thinking, and ultimately, new ways of living. And that's the whole point of becoming a rebellious lion in the first place, to become free enough in our being so that we can then become the playful creators of new forms of subjectivity and ultimately new forms of existence altogether. In essence, transcendence, the subtle art of passing beyond ourselves, is the point of human existence and hence the point of laying claim to human freedom through rebellion. Okay, 
So, at this point, let's take a minute to summarize and expand upon some of the main points in all of this, especially with respect to the motif of rebellion. First, what rebellion is ultimately about is freedom, and more specifically, laying claim to the freedom that's necessary for us to become the creative artists of life itself. However, one of the difficulties of making rebellion the main theme of our existence has to do with what I like to call the rebel's paradox. Basically, the paradox is that when we make rebelling against something, the principal thrust of our existence, well, <laughs> then what we're doing is defining ourselves in terms of whatever it is we're rebelling against. Most likely, something we despise. An example. Adolescents will sometimes find themselves rebelling against their parents, and hence trying to be the exact opposite of them. Trying to dress very differently, trying to adopt the opposite of their parents' values, political affiliations, religious convictions, etc., only to discover, <laughs> if they're lucky enough, that in their eagerness to define themselves in opposition to their parents, they're still being defined exactly by their parents, just in an inverted form. A little bit like a photographic negative, if you'll permit a little old-school simile. In other words, the point of adolescent rebellion, which is a fairly natural and common thing, isn't to become an inverted version of our parents. The point is ultimately to pass beyond the rebel's paradox and to become, well, ourselves. And finally, Part of what makes Nietzsche's schema interesting, and somewhat disquieting, is that it's a way of questioning how we usually construe moral development, which would be to think of moral conformity and obedience as the highest, most desirable state. For Nietzsche, behaving like a morally appropriate robot or camel is actually the least developed form of spirit. To be an inappropriate rebel who stubbornly refuses to carry the burden of other people's morality for them is actually a higher, more developed form because it takes a much higher level of perspicacity, courage, and backbone to deviate from the dictates of the blinkered herd. And to be an amoral child who has transcended the paradigm of good and evil altogether is a higher form yet because the child's way of being is what gives birth to new forms of value and perception and new patterns of life altogether, which is ultimately humanity's deeper purpose and destiny in the first place. And personally, I find that that's a crucial insight that practically all of today's forms of social activism are missing, which of course is one of today's most common and popular ways of rebelling against different aspects of our world. The political aspect, for instance, or the economic or ideological ones. Following Nietzsche's analysis, it would be a mistake to think that a lion-like rebellion against our world's status quo will actually produce genuine and deep change in it. That's because real change issues from a very different source, the child's playful creativity, especially at the level of our perception and subjectivity. In other words, the reality of human existence is that the coercive logic of the activist's clenched fist hardly ever forces our world to change or develop in any significant way. Instead, that logic mostly just produces hardened resistance and oppositions to its own stated goals, even when those goals are self-evidently positive and in our world's best interest. Personally, I'd say that it's pretty easy to observe that dynamic in today's political arena. But, if it still seems a little abstract and counterintuitive, let's bring it down to a more immediate, personal level. Think about it. How often do you really change in your heart and mind? You know, the places where it really counts, just because someone is trying like hell to shame and bully you into it. If I were to tell you, you better start loving your fellow man, you dumb, deplorable fascist, how are you probably going to react to that? Think about it for a second, because I bet that the last thing you're going to feel like doing is loving your fellow man, even though it's not a bad idea to do so. Basically, the point is that belligerent, rebellious lions don't really change the world. Playful, creative children do. As Nietzsche once again puts it, thoughts that come on dove's feet guide the world.
In other words, it's not the strident, clamorous voices braying on the nightly news that compel our world to give birth to something beyond itself, but those that are barely perceptible amidst all of our world's moronic din and cacophony. Or, to put it another way, those of us who are desperately trying to force our world to change aren't going to be the ones who actually change it. <laughs> Surprise! Of course, as Nietzsche says, rebellion can be an important step in that direction, as long as it doesn't degenerate into just another form of obedient, burden-carrying roboticism, the kind where supposed rebellion becomes little more than an ideological fashion statement or an exercise in the crude self-aggrandizement of virtue signaling, tendencies which seem all too prevalent in a lot of today's activism which is probably a big part of why it's so commonly lampooned by way of the now ubiquitous NPC meme. However, like I mentioned earlier in this video, rebellion can also play out in a much more internal way. Basically, the kind of rebellion that occurs within ourselves rather than in reaction to the workings of the external world. But what is it to rebel against ourselves? Well, internal rebellion basically has to do with perceiving our faults and shortcomings and then adopting an attitude of defiance toward them, refusing to be enslaved by all that's cheap and hollow and counterfeit in our souls. You know, everything that seems all too warped and all too inauthentic. And at this point, we're starting to get close to the terrain of self-hate, which isn't necessarily a negative thing, especially since it can spur us toward changing our lives for the better. However, since I recently made a video about that, if you want to hear more about the positive value of self-hate, I'll put a link to it in the description section of this video. But suffice it to say that internal rebellion first requires developing a capacity for a reflective self-perception, which in turn requires a certain measure of unflinching honesty. And the thing about that is, <laughs> well, those aren't necessarily common qualities in our world. Sure, they're the kinds of things that we all like to think we possess in abundance, but the unpopular reality is that very few of us actually do. When it comes down to it, most of us are basically camels in our own interiority, simply thinking of ourselves as basically good, smart, decent specimens of humanity without any serious flaws that really need to be addressed. Consequently, very few of us have the courage to become the relentless predators of our own faults and failings and to lay claim to a much wider range of personal freedom in the process. But here, once again, the question becomes, freedom for what? After all, isn't it enough in life just to carry our loads obediently, whether they're externally imposed or more internal in nature? Well, maybe for some people it is enough, both with respect to the demands of the external world as well as within the deeper recesses of our souls. It's really a very, very personal question. How free do you really want to be in this life and what are you willing to sacrifice, most of all within yourself, in order to reach it? And by the way, it's probably good to remember that the Latinate etymology of the word sacrifice actually means <laughs> to make holy. So when I ask, what are you willing to sacrifice within yourself for your freedom? I also mean, what are you willing to make holy within yourself? That might seem like a trivial question, but it can actually be pretty cutting and powerful if you ask it in the right way. Perhaps as moonlight is creeping through your window during the long, forlorn night of your solitude. And this brings us to the most general form of rebellion. Not rebellion directed specifically against X, Y, or Z, either in the external world or within ourselves, but existential rebellion against the entire game of life itself. But at this point, perhaps you're wondering why anyone would do that. Well, the answer is that when you think about it, life is actually pretty absurd and unreasonable a lot of the time. And probably the thinker who articulates that best would be the French-Algerian philosopher and novelist Albert Camus, the same guy I quoted at the very start of this video.
According to him, life is absurd and essentially unreasonable in any number of ways. But the most important one has to do with how life obstinately refuses to give us what we really long for, which is definite concrete knowledge about what the whole game is really about. Life, in all of her divine indifference, answers pretty much none of our burning questions, at least not the fundamental ones, such as, where are we going, especially after death, or is there some reasonable guarantee of justice in this universe, or what's the real point of our lives if there even is one? And damn, wouldn't it be nice if someone could, anyone, could just tell us what the whole freaking game is really about? Of course, practically every major world religion tries to do that, but the problem in that domain is that the answers vary so wildly from religion to religion. Maybe there's a final moral judgment leading us to either heaven or hell. Or maybe there's an endless sequence of reincarnations according to the dictates of karma. Or maybe all of the valiant warriors in this life will join Odin in the halls of Valhalla. Or hell, maybe there's nothing at all absolute oblivion. Who knows? The point is that it's hard to say with any degree of certainty. Sure, there are always plenty of people who are willing to claim to know the answers to the big questions, but the one great constant of life is that no one actually does. When it comes down to it, we're all just cosmological ignoramuses. And we're all just guessing as best we can and trying to deal with whatever comes our way from moment to moment. Underneath it all, we naturally yearn to witness the truth of life in the brilliant clarity of the noonday sun, but instead we're left groping blindly in a world whose night knows no end. And for Camus, there's something fundamentally absurd and unreasonable about that, and the only sane, rational response to it lies in our rebellion. That is, in our ongoing refusal to accept or give in to the ridiculousness of our existential plight. And if, at certain points in our lives, it seems like we actually are able to accept and embrace it, it's only because we haven't yet fathomed how hopelessly absurd our lot in this life really is. Once that moment of agonizing lucidity arrives, once the veil of our habitual evasions and self-deception has been definitively lifted, it will very quickly become obvious that rebellion is our only realistic response and that the rest is little more than a combination of distraction and wishful thinking. Of course, at this point, it might seem like the only really effective way of rebelling at that level would be through suicide, either in its literal form or in a more figurative way, by trying to kill off the parts of our minds that would be able to recognize the unreasonable absurdity of our existential predicament. Who knows, perhaps by keeping ourselves perpetually narcotized by the entertainment and commodity culture that surrounds us. However, it turns out that for Camus, suicide in any form is actually the exact opposite of real rebellion against life. The reason is that, in reality, committing suicide would be nothing more than a way of going along with the ultimate absurdity of everything. A way of tacitly agreeing that life is indeed so unreasonable that the only realistic response is to try to escape from its insufferable horror. But for Camus, if that's our response to life's absurdity, then once again, we haven't yet confronted how bad things actually are. Because if we were to understand that in the deepest way possible, in no way would we seek to agree with it by trying to escape from it. Our only viable response at that point would be to oppose it with every fiber of our being. And so, somewhat ironically, the only real way of rebelling against life would be to maintain an extremely lucid awareness of how absurd and ridiculous it all is, and then to live through it moment by moment anyhow, all the way to its bitter end, and even to find a weird kind of happiness in it along the way. Although needless to say, that's not even remotely like happiness in the usual sense of the word, especially since it's in a very lucid, intimate relation to rebellion and existential defiance. It's a little bit like how if we're condemned to prison, 
in much the same way that we're condemned to live out a life in this world, the most defiant attitude would be to get into the experience as much as possible, to become enchanted with whatever we're experiencing in it, and in a strange paradoxical way, to find a kind of happiness in it. That's defiant because unlike trying to escape our condemnation, getting into it essentially negates its character as a condemnation. After all, if someone wants us to suffer in prison, but we actually manage to have a good time instead, even in the midst of all of our pain and loneliness, well, then the condemnation isn't working because our rebellion has managed to negate it and has turned the experience into something else instead. Okay, so at this point, let me move toward ending this video, as I usually do, by offering a few prescriptive suggestions to consider. First, if you find yourself in the throes of rebellion, either against the world or against yourself, or even against life in its entirety, well, ride that experience for all it's worth. It's a perfectly understandable human response to a stupid world and to the stupidity that resides in all of us. After all, rebellion is an exhilarating, emotionally exciting experience and part of our very human birthright. And in the spirit of Nietzsche's analysis, see if you can let your desire for rebellion, your longing to say a simple no to all of the myriad thou shalts of this world, let that moment be your moment of liberation. See if you can let that experience detach you from the seduction of living like a glorified beast of burden. But at the same time, be wary of letting all of that excitement draw you back into the maddening crowd where rebellion becomes just another facade for a new type of conformity and obedience, just another empty virtue signaling fashion statement. Remember that your real rebellion, the rebellion that stirs in the secret depths of your heart, isn't about drawing you towards some new herd of bleeding sheep, but about a very personal form of liberation, the kind of liberation whereby you might eventually start to fulfill your own unique, luminous destiny in this life. And along the way, try not to become too infatuated with the fantasy that your rebellion will somehow change the world. Remember that whether you rebel against it or not, the world will continue to be the world, and other people will continue to be what they are, irrespective of your eagerness to force them to obey your own personal ideology and agenda. And finally, remember that at the end of the day, our lives change mostly as a function of our ability to accept them as they really are and to love them despite all of the powerful, convincing reasons we all have to do otherwise. Because in the final analysis, there will always be 10,000 great reasons to rebel against the way things are and the way we ourselves are, and only one or two good reasons to fall in love with them and hence to allow them to pass gracefully beyond themselves. Basically, remember that in the end, love wins. And your love for life may turn out to be your deepest way of rebelling against it. <laughs> Surprise! Anyhow, just a thought for your rebellious spirit. And as always, thanks for watching. Take care of your soul. Bye-bye.